Hello and welcome to Time of Death. I'm your host Dee. And I'm your host Riss. And together we are Time of Death. Welcome to an exhilarating episode of Time of Death. If you're new here, we are two nurses that like to talk true crime. We like to talk about cases that feature a medical professional as the perpetrator or the victim. And we just like to focus on cases that have a heavy medical influence to them or cases that uh, are just interesting in a medical sense. My case next week is not going to involve medical professional. What? <laughs> Does it have to do with something medical? Yeah. We can stretch the definition. <laughs> we make it work. We make it work. Yes, we fit into all kinds of brief, not just one box. You can't put us into just one box. No, you can't trap us into a box. We jump out. We'll break out. Yeah. We'll break out outside the box. Yeah. Fort Knox box. Fort Does that mean? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, oh, anyways, okay. all right. Okay, this week we're going to be talking about a nurse who, she's pretty well known. She killed in the 1990s. She killed several patients and is rumored to have been the cause of like 300 plus medical emergencies. 300? So, yeah. 300? 300 medical emergencies. Damn. So... Kristen Heather Strickland was born on November 13th, 1967 in Fall River, Massachusetts. This, by the way, is also where Lizzie Borden was from. Now that the hair on the back of my neck stood up. <laughs> <laughs> and also, if she hated all like serial killers have like nicknames, mm -hmm. like Son of Sam or whatever, Strickland, she should have been called Strick Nine. I thought you were going to say daughter of Lizzie. <laughs> say strychnine? Strychnine! Isn't that a poison? Yeah. Strychnine poisoning. No, it's strychnine. 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 <laughs> what strychnine. is strychnine? It's a poison. What kind, though? I think it's a paralytic. Google it. I don't want my phone on me. I think you're right. Let me see. Anything murder, I know. You know, like a fountain of knowledge. So strychnine is a strychnine. Strychnine. <laughs> strychnine. Strychnine is a highly toxic, colorless, bitter, crystalline alkaloid used as a pesticide. Is it a paralytic? Aren't a lot of pesticides paralytic? I think so. I think it probably is then. Strychnine. <laughs> We're so um, onset of toxicosis is rapid and results in agitation, stiff gait, tremors, seizures, and respiratory arrest and death. Paralysis. Paralysis. Anyway, so she was born to... Wait, hold on. Aren't you going to acknowledge that cute nickname? Heather. Kristen Heather Strychnine. Strychnine. <laughs> Well, she does poison her victims, so... Get the hell out of here! Okay. That's what you have to call that episode. No. Yeah. No, I've already come up with the name. What is it? Killer Superstar Nurse. Are you... <laughs> <laughs> you said that, like, so confidently, too. Killer Superstar Nurse. Superstar Nurse. R-N. <laughs> Superstar R-N. S S R N. Those are my creds. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Sorry, not to. Not That's to okay. No, okay. Go That's do okay. I'll continue. To continue. Okay, so Kristen was born to Richard and Claudia Strickland, and she had one younger sister. Richard worked actually in electronics, and Claudia was a part time teacher. Kristen did well in school and was a smart student. She was even a member of the math club growing up. But in her teen years, family and friends started noticing a bad habit Kristen had. She was a liar. She would lie without reason, aka she was a pathological liar. <laughs> but, you know, she lied about things that you didn't need to lie about, which like, is... Kids lie. No, this is her, I mean... Yeah, but she's a teenager, and she's lying about literally everything. I Listen, I was a teen. I lied. 
teenagers lie. That's no. like part of the okay. Yeah. Even like the oldest daughter became a nurse, younger sister, mom's a teacher. I was like, oh shit. That's so true. You don't want to relate to this one. <laughs> but um, we'll continue and see how many other similarities there are. Oh anyway, so. But teenagers do lie. They do lie. Not her lying wasn't normal. So <gasps> Heather lied about her daily activity. She lied about just stuff that was pointless to lie about. She lied about important things too, though. Like the fact that her mom was an abusive alcoholic. This was never found to be true, according to other family members, and there was no evidence of this lie to be true. She also lied in claiming that she was a relative of Lizzie Borden's to anyone that would listen. So she would also fake suicide attempts for attention and to manipulate people she needed in order to get what she wanted. That, or she would just make threats targeted towards the people in her path. See, she sounds borderline. I didn't see an official diagnosis, but I think that's probably, like, all of these, all of this history she has. Mm -hmm. Our uh, psych nurse here, your two sense is that she's borderline personality disorder. Potentially. Potentially. You would use, you know, you have to talk to the patient. Yeah. But this is, like, some red flags for borderline personality disorder. So, she was vindictive, manipulative, physically and verbally abusive to her romantic partners growing up, but she was popular, she was well-liked, and she was a successful student. She actually ended up graduating early from Groton Dunstable Regional High School when she was only 16 years old, and then she went on to attend Bridgewater State College in Bridgewater, Mass., or Massachusetts, she was planning on getting her RN at this time. While at this college, Kristen made suicidal and homicidal statements. She wrote a note to a boyfriend that she ate glass. She faked the suicide attempt. A boyfriend of hers reported it to the college, saying that he was scared she might hurt or kill someone, and the college officials ordered her to have psychiatric treatment through therapy in order for her to keep attending there. What? Yeah. So, as you can imagine, she did not like this. Summer break quickly came, and she met Glenn Gilbert, and the two quickly started dating, and they fell in love. That fall, she transferred to Mount Wachusett Community College in Gardner, Massachusetts, to be closer to Glenn. Around this time, she also started working as a home health aide, And in August 1987, she went to visit a patient for the first time. This this patient was a special needs child who was in the care of a foster family. So Kristen ended up giving him a bath, and then she tucked him into bed before leaving the house with another nurse who was caring for another patient. His parents checked on him and discovered burns all over his body. So they were, of course, horrified, and they thought to themselves, you know what, our faucet has a, like, stopper to it that it doesn't let the heat go past a a certain point, and you have to, like, manually unlock it to push it past that setting. And so they run to the bathroom, it's back where it normally is, So they're hypothesizing, okay, it wasn't, like, broken or disconnected. She must have taken it manually off, put it to a scalding hot temperature, burned the poor child, and then replaced it and corrected it before tucking him into bed and then leaving. So... People were sociopathic. mm Mm-hmm. So they call the home health agency. They tell them that Kristen was dangerous. She was not allowed to ever come back there. However, the home health agency still let Kristen be a home health aide after this point. What? That's child I know. abuse. I know. In 1988, she marries Glenn Gilbert. That same year, she finished her schooling at Greenfield Community College in Greenfield, Massachusetts, where she graduated with a nursing degree, and she passed the licensure exam and became an RN. She began working at the Veteran Affairs Medical Center, or VAMC, in Northampton, Massachusetts, 
She worked in the ICU there, and specifically, she worked in Ward C. She worked as an evening shift and night shift RN. Kristen's career started out beautifully. She was even featured in 1990 in a magazine called The VA Practitioner. Uh, She was a bright nurse and even started up a yearly gift exchange for disadvantaged families to obtain necessities. She was regarded as kind of a pillar of strength, especially during crises, and she always was able to catch patients who were going downhill quickly. She remained cool and collected while patients were coding. She was just regarded as a really successful nurse and really quickly on. In 1990, a doctor found out that Kristen was the primary RN for the majority of patient deaths in their unit. Kristen called 13 out of 18 codes or other medical emergencies. So the doctor didn't do much about this. He just was like, eh, I don't want Kristen working on any of my patients anymore. So... In 1991, another healthcare worker found out that for the last two years, Kristen's shifts had three times the deaths compared to other shifts. There were 22 deaths reported by Kristen versus the next highest nurse only reported five. Wow. So this healthcare worker brought it to the manager, but nothing was made of it. It was just swept away like, okay, I think you're overreacting. So time passed and her co-workers jokingly nicknamed her Angel of Death Mm -hmm. due to an increased volume of deaths in their unit while Kristen was on the clock. They recognized the increase, but they didn't think anything sinister was going on at this point. And side note, Kristen loved being the center of attention. She loved basking in the, oh my god, Kristen, like, angel of death, ha ha, ha." like, you always get the sickest patients. So, Kristen's marriage to Glenn started failing by 1995. They have two kids at this point. They were constantly fighting. Their relationship was super rocky at this point. In one argument, she chased Glenn throughout the house with a butcher knife. So, I think it's fair to say they weren't doing well at all. By this time, Kristen met James Peralt. He was a veteran and a security guard at VAMC. The two began flirting, and one night the two kissed, and then a full-blown affair began. James, as a security guard, would go to these codes and medical emergencies and had to be on scene, which is pretty routine, like when we have um, codes or rapids, Um, Any kind of, like, behavioral health code or any other code, they always come to see if you need them to at least check in. He would always be there whenever Kristen's events would occur. So, in August 1995, Stanley Jedikowski was a 66-year-old veteran. He had just had a leg amputation. He had a pretty bad infection and lost his leg. And he was actually doing really well, and he was set to be moved to a unit with a lower level of care. At 8 p.m., he was all tucked in, ready for bed, but his sleep was interrupted by Kristen. So Kristen was in the room, and a few minutes go by, and the other nurses in the unit hear a scream come from his room. So they all run in. Kristen slides her way out, and he's holding his arm and he just looks terrified. So they calmed him down right before he coded. What? So he goes into cardiac arrest, and they got him back that time. Then he coded again three more times, and they were unable to get him back the final time. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Kristen's marriage was still declining, of course, and she began cooking for her husband, which Glenn recalled as being really odd, but he ate it. Oh, and he should not have eaten it. I know. <laughs> That's red flag number yep. one. He didn't really think much of it, but a co-worker reported that Kristen had stolen nifedipine and captopril from their hospital. These are blood pressure medications that, when used in high amounts, can cause a lot of issues. 
So the coworker did see her taking these meds, but we are unsure if she actually was poisoning Glenn's food. However, of note, Glenn did tell a friend that, quote, my wife is trying to get me out of the house by Thanksgiving. So, sounds to me it's a safe assumption that she was poisoning him. Yeah. And then he started getting sick. Yeah, there you go. So, on November 5th, he developed nausea, muscle aches, and he called Kristen, who was working at the time. Why? She comes, she drives him to the ER. His potassium level was really low, and he had an abnormal heart rate. Mm. Cardiac meds, I think. Yep. So he was stabilized and ended up being discharged. Glenn claimed that Kristen wanted to take a sample of his blood to test it at her hospital after some time had passed of him being home. She's like, eh, I don't really trust this hospital. Like, let me just take a sample of your blood and then I'm going to take it to my hospital, have them run it, and then we'll make sure that they're doing it right. Isn't that fraudulent? That is. And also, like, ha- how are you going it, to... It's fraudulent, and I, I mean, maybe it was different in the 1990s, but <laughs> I'd need an order. <laughs> I'd need an order to do that. Kristen has Glenn come to the bathroom with her, and she reveals some supplies to get his blood along with a... To draw his blood along with a syringe with a clear solution in it. Uh-oh. And Kristen's like, okay, this is saline. I have to flush your vein to get blood. Which, when you're starting an IV, if that's not even true when you're starting an IV. Like, you have to flush the line when you're done drawing blood out of it. But she's not starting an IV. She's drawing blood. She's using blood draw equipment. And she's not starting an IV. So she does not, therefore, need a flush. At least to my knowledge. I don't know if they did things differently in the 1990s. But I don't think they ever needed a flush to draw blood. Right? I've never heard of that. If anything, I think it would dilute the sample. Yeah, so, because you need to, like, when we're pulling off people's IVs, sometimes we do that, and we always have to draw a couple waste tubes if you're drawing off the line, because the IV already has saline in it when you are using an existing IV line, so you just always have to draw a couple waste tubes, but I digress. Anyway, she goes, okay, I need to flush your vein to get blood. Glenn's like, all right, I don't know. He doesn't know what, you know, the routine is. So she starts the process and Glenn said his arm got cold and he began pulling away. But Kristen pinned him against the wall with her hip and he ends up passing out. He wakes up and Kristen's like, ah, you passed out when I got the needle. And then she left with him lying on the floor. (laughs) I'm just laughing because this is just ridiculous. So soon after this, Kristen left Glenn and their kids to be with James. So she moves closer to work and her relationship with James moves forward. What Uh, happened to her current husband at the time after she injected him? He survived. He ends up in the trial later on. He never sought medical attention? After that? I don't think so. Not that I could find. He was traumatized. Yeah. So, um... On December 8th, 1995, Henry Houdon was a 35-year-old Air Force veteran with schizophrenia, which he was diagnosed with after a head injury when he was trying to break up a bar fight a few years prior. Is that abnormal? Does that happen, like, after a head injury like that? Yeah. Can you you tell us about that? You can have psychosis after, like, a traumatic brain injury. It Mm. can happen. It's very unfortunate. But, like... Would that be the start of the diagnosis, or would it be like in, um, like they already have a predisposition to develop the disorder and then the head injury? Because he's like a probably like thirty or twenty in his twenties at the, this time. Yeah. Would he have like a predisposition to developing it? I think a predis like a family history of schizophrenia puts everybody at a higher risk for schizophrenia mm-hmm. and other like any type of mental illness, bipolar. Anything like that that puts you at a higher, there's a f- strong familial component. But when you add trauma into the mix, something that may have not been expressed, mm-hmm. most uh, higher likelihood. I can try to find some statistics, but it's not uncommon to hear like psychosis after a TBI. Right. It could be a result of the brain injury sustained. Oh, I see. Wow. Okay. So he's pretty well known to the staff at VAMC. He came in because he wasn't really feeling that great, and uh, he was brought up into Kristen's unit. 
uh, he was very stable until Kristen came in for her shift. So he goes into cardiac arrest. He's found by Kristen. They got him back and 45 minutes later, he codes again, but he survived. And then this happened a total of four times. Jeez. And then he passed after the fourth time he coded. Mm-hmm. These are young men. Yeah, these are young men and they're like 30 years old to 60s. That so is. they we'll, we'll go in more about that later on during the trial because it's kind of bizarre that the defense kind of tried to claim that these were all natural death by natural causes and it's clearly not well it's interesting because even when her husband who's giving him the injection you said he she kind of hip checked him Mm -hmm. and you know if she's a a woman you know she's not going to be as physically as big as men typically so it's interesting that she was able she would have to physically overpower them at some point yeah so that's interesting or like People, you know, they have an IV probably already. They're in the hospital like, oh, I'm just flushing your IV. But really, you're giving a harmful medication through the IV, That's like what she ends up doing. If she's using the IV, yeah. And if they're all like at a more acute setting, it would make sense for them to have all IVs. Yeah. Maybe but, she's uh, putting medication in so she can overpower them, overpower them too. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you, to give someone with schizophrenia... Typically, in this generalization, to give someone with schizophrenia a medication, a lot of times their paranoia comes into play and it's difficult to give them medication. So it's just interesting that she did that with him. Yeah. After Henry's death, staff was really increasingly suspicious. They knew something was happening, but they did not have proof. In February 1996, a friend and co worker of Kristen's, her name was Kathy, she was also growing increasingly suspicious. Kathy started looking more closely at a drug, epinephrine. Ward C was going through 25 doses of epinephrine bi-weekly. This was super weird, so she started tracking the amount of epinephrine coming in and going out. 40 minutes before the death of Kenneth Cutting, who was a 41-year-old veteran, Kristen had asked her manager if she could leave early if a sick patient were to die. Kenneth had multiple sclerosis, and he was blind, and he died 40 minutes after she asked this. That's such a bizarre request. I know. Empty epinephrine vials were nearby his dead body when he was found. On February 1996, 68-year-old World War II veteran Edward Squira, who was battling alcoholism, uh, came into their facility. So he had been detoxing at another facility, and then he was transferred to VAMC. Initially, he reported chest pain, so he was brought to the ICU just to be safe. And a CT scan showed a CT scan showed a possible aortic aneurysm. Mm-hmm. So they were planning to transfer him to a higher level acuity hospital for surgery. Wait, I just want to say all of these people are. Part of the VA then, so they're all former yep. military. They're all mm-hmm. former, they're all veterans. I wonder if that's the connection. Mm-hmm. Before leaving, he had more chest pain and it was getting worse and worse. So Kristen calls a code or calls a medical emergency, I should say, and is like, he's having really severe chest pain and the doctors are like, okay, let's get him to the other hospital. Like, let's go. And... Kristen actually rode with them to the other hospital, which was Bay State. Kathy, our girl, checks her inventory and sees three vials of epinephrine missing. And furthermore, in the Sharps container next to Ed's old bed that he just left, the empty vials were sitting inside. Ed died on February 18th, 1996. Things were just getting worse and worse. And on February 17th, 1996, three different nurses reported an increase in deaths following cardiac arrests and also reported that they were going through way too much epinephrine and that they were deeply suspicious of Kristen. So the manager did not go directly to the supervisor and the nurses were terrified that others were going to die while they were waiting. 
However, while Kristen came into work that same day and the nurses were like, Kristen, can you be the charge nurse? Because they were trying to get her to kind of away from patient Mm -hmm. care. Um, And she said, nah, I'm going to be a primary nurse for these patients. Like, no, I'm not doing charge. So. Can't stop the angel of death. No. So Kristen faked that a patient injured her. She was screaming and came out of a patient's room. This was a pretty frail, demented patient. So she came running, screaming out of this patient's room, and she's holding her shoulder, saying that this patient dislocated her shoulder. Side note, she was actually double-jointed, and she would pop her shoulder (laughs) out on occasion as a, a neat trick that she would do. Okay. But she goes home, and she was on leave for the dislocation. So an investigation was done by the VAMC, and it was reassuring that the number of deaths were consistent with those at other VA hospitals. But the nurses did not let up and push that something wasn't right. Thank for these nurses. Yes, thank God for nurses. And attention thank and God. caring. Police began an investigation, and they start interviewing everybody, and they interview Kristen. And she was super odd. She claimed that she did not know that they carried epi, epinephrine, in their unit, which I don't understand. (laughs) Which just is like, okay, we clearly know you're lying. Also, her claims of the attack by that patient was just changing and growing more and more bizarre every time she would tell the story. She also said she was not even the primary nurse for these patients who died. Like, just really bizarre lies that just made absolutely no sense. She actually started asking her coworkers what the police were asking them Mm. and pressured them to remember things differently Mm. than what the truth was. This included her boyfriend, James. Don't forget about him. So police convene a grand jury and they are working they are working on subpoenaing sub, subpoenaing how would you say that subpoenaing James subpoenaing subpoenaing James So James meanwhile is deciding okay I'm pretty sure I don't want to date this woman like she looks super shady to me now too so he takes her out to dinner he breaks up with her and she doesn't take it that great On September 26, 1996, Kristen decided, okay, I can't let them get too far with this investigation. So what do you think she does, D? She pins it on James. No. Stages a suicide attempt. No, she calls him a bomb threat. Oof, she called him a bomb threat. (laughs) She didn't even look like she had. She does this to distract law enforcement. So she calls and James, her ex-boyfriend, answers. And she calls in a bomb threat. And James is like, oh my god, rush, rush, rush. Like, trying to warn everybody, get everybody out. Um, Kristen calls back several times with the same threat. And James realizes this is a recording and it's altered. Like, the voice is altered. It was um, a distorted voice. So, there was no actual bomb found. The um, caller actually, Kristen, called a few days later and talked to a nurse and asked if she remembered the threat. And the nurse is like, yeah, I do remember the threat. And then Kristen hangs up. (laughs) (laughs) However, this nurse actually recognized the voice recorder that Kristen used because this you know, call days later also was altered. But the nurse recognizes the voice recorder, like the specific distortion that she used was from a movie. I think it was like Home Alone or something like that. I was going Scream. <laughs> scream. Um, and she actually was able to uncover the voice of Kristen. Oh, my. And tells police. So on October 1st, 1996, police... Isn't that just wild? That's a great piece of detective work. I gotta give it to that. You know what? These nurses are amazing. 
<laughs> you have Kathy out, out here counting epinephrine vials. Mm -hmm. You have this nurse decoding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Twice is this. I'm, I'm not freaking fine. I'm, it's that Kristen <laughs> girl. I just time. know. They wanted her to be the charge nurse. Mm -hmm. They did a lot to protect their they patients. They did, yeah. yeah. So... October 1st, 1996, police come with a warrant to search Kristen's house, and wouldn't you know, they find the same recorder. So, they're continuing their investigation. They are digging through various suspicious deaths of patients at her hospital. They don't have enough to charge her just yet. Meanwhile, Kristen gets spooked. She leaves her job in 1996. And then in fall of that year, she begins going in and out of psychiatric hospitals. She ends up being hospitalized seven different times during this period. And during one hospitalization, she ends up calling James and says, I did it. I did it. You wanted to know I killed all those guys by injection. See, she's trying to set up a case for an insanity plea. Mm. That's what it sounds like to oh, me. Yeah. Well, actually, it doesn't go that route, surprisingly. Good. I'm happy to hear it doesn't go that yeah. route. So, on October 8th, she checks herself out of a psychiatric hospital. And that same day, moments after being released, she was arrested for calling in the bomb threat. Hmm. Kristen stands trial for calling the bomb threat. She says that she did it in order to get back at her coworkers and her boyfriend, James, for them helping out with the police investigation. She was convicted for this crime and she served 15 months. So police are like, okay, we can't get her for murder yet, oh. but we can at least get her for making this bomb threat. Mm -hmm. So while she was in prison, she was charged with killing Henry Houdon, Kenneth Cutting, Edward Squira, and then Stanley Jekodowski. So the cause of death for all these men was a heart attack. But autopsies occurred and showed that they died of epinephrine poisoning. A cardiologist stated that none of these men had significant cardiac issues. They were all young and uh, relatively healthy and that their deaths were consistent with epinephrine toxicity. From the period of time from January 1995 until February 1996, Kristen was working when 37 out of 63 patients on her ward passed. Wow. Oh my. Her co-workers believe that Kristen was responsible for more than 80 deaths and more than 300 critical medical situations. That's crazy because she was only charged with, what, four men? Mm. Huh? She was only charged with four men's mm. murders? Yeah. But she was responsible for at least yeah. 80. Because I'm sure that they're under-exaggerating. Yeah. Kristen was believed to have falsified medical records in order to cover her tracks. The prosecutor during her trial stated that the reason she triggered these emergencies was to get the attention of James, her boyfriend. Ralt goes on to testify that while she was hospitalized, she had called him and confessed to killing someone. Her ex-husband, Kristen, and her husband divorced in 1998, also reported that she confessed to the murders to him as well. Defense argues that Kristen made these confessions while hospitalized and while she was under a great deal of stress. The prosecution's bringing up other crimes that she has committed, such as in 1988, Kristen assaulted someone in Greenfield, Mass, using a large kitchen knife. In 1994, she removed a patient's breathing tube. In November 1995, one of her patients was actively in cardiac arrest when Kristen left them and recruited another nurse to check her patients with her. The nurse saw the patient in cardiac arrest and they finally intervened. That same month, Kristen refused to use defib paddles on a patient that was in cardiac arrest and needed to be shocked because their heart was in an abnormal rhythm. So another healthcare worker needed to use them, but they had no training in their use. In 1996, it was reported that Kristen threatened at least one person with verbal and physical means. And she also had a history as the PCA, and then it wasn't just in the context when she was assaulted that young boy. Burns, yeah. 
you know. She has a pattern of violence. Uh, you're completely right. So the trial's continuing. Her defense remains steadfast. Kristen is pleading not guilty. Defense is saying, you know, there's a lack of evidence to convict her. They argued that the deaths were all natural. Her defense attorney argued that it is easier to incite good and decent people to kill when their target is not a human, but a demon. Kristen Gilbert is not a monster. She is a human being. What? Yep. They also argued that her co-workers were angry that she was having an affair and falsely accused her of murder in order to get back at her. What? Just wait. He also described Kristen as being under immense stress from her grandfather's death, the unraveling of her marriage, and her affair. He said, I don't know what caused her to break down and spiral to the depths of where she is today. Assistant U.S. Attorney Welch, on the other hand, argued that people don't snap for a seventh-month period and kill four people. A psychiatrist in the Northampton VAMC, so the same hospital, suggested that she created these situations in order to showcase her skills as a nurse. Staff from VMA, VAM speculated that she wanted to prove herself as a exemplary RN that could handle these crises and wow i'm a superstar or hence the title of this podcast episode others theorize that she created these emergencies to get the attention of james peralt the judge allowed family members of the victim of the victims to make a statement claire jagodowski who was the wife of one of kristen's victims stanley jagodowski said, I still listen for his keys in the door. Now I have to face old age alone. In 2001, Kristen was found guilty of three counts of first degree murder, one count of second degree murder, and two counts of attempted murder. So she killed four veterans and attempted to kill two more using epinephrine. Massachusetts didn't have capital punishment and they still don't to this day. Um, It's been banned, if you didn't know, uh, from their state since 1984. But because her crimes were made on federal property, which was the veterans' hospital, she was liable to the death penalty. So prosecution was pushing for the death penalty. Kristen's father and both of her grandmothers pleaded with the jury to not do the death penalty, saying it would devastate their family and Kristen's children. On March 26th, 2001, the jury recommended a life sentence, and the next day she was sentenced to four consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole, plus 20 years. While the sentencing was read, she wept quietly to herself. One sister of the victim, Henry Houdon, her name was Christine Duquette, she was hoping for the death penalty. She stated in regard to the life sentence that It wouldn't have been my first choice, but I'm happy it's over. It's over and done with, finally. I'm not disappointed. Kristen had made an appeal for a new trial. However, in July 2003, she dropped it because the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that prosecutors could pursue a death penalty during retrials. So she thought better of it. She remains imprisoned in Fort Worth, Texas to this day. And that's about it for Kristen Gilbert's heinous crimes i think Kristen was just a bad apple she was a bad apple and uh you know usually like with some people you can understand why they were the way that they were but with her i just don't see it yeah you know and all of these victims were veterans um and she just really took advantage of a vulnerable population. So I'm so sorry to all the family members of these victims. And that's about it. I don't really have much to say say to Kristen. Me neither. Anything you want to add? (laughs) No, I think we're good. All right. All right, Kristen. Hope you're enjoying jail. (laughs) TTYL, Kristen. TTYL. Okay, everyone. Good night. Farewell. See you soon. Au revoir. Well, we won't see you, but we'll hear you next week. They'll hear us.
Mostly D, because it's her turn. Yeah, so there's going to be a great case. Not me- I'm not give related. a spoiler? No. Give a hint. Give a hint. A hint, 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 hint. It involves a famous actor. Leonardo da Vinci. And a famous actor. <laughs> <Wait, wait. laughs> I didn't even get these. I knew exactly who you meant. I was like, Leonardo DiCaprio. Da Vinci? I said, I know she means Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm not even in the front. <laughs> uh, who else? And a Canadian serial serial killer. Who could that be? This is recent. Really? Yeah, not like so so recent. What does that have to do with medical? So anything at all? Absolutely, it does. What? It's a true crime community okay. anomaly. I don't know if I'm being big enough. Dee, does it really have something to do with medical? Yes. Or are you pushing it too much? It has to do with. Parkinson's. Oh, okay. That relates. I sure as hell does. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a fascinating case. It's very sad, too. Yeah. On a couple different levels, it's sad, but it's really, it's um, very interesting. I stumbled upon it quite recently. Sounds good to me? It better. All right, everyone, we're going to call it. <laughs> All right, I don't, it's probably like 9 o'clock. We took, this was a long one. This was a long one. 2047, which is 847 p.m. for those of you who do not use military time. We're going to go to bed. Well, I'm going to edit. Dee's going to curl up in bed. No, I have to go take a shower. <laughs> All right. But you know what? If you guys are interested in hearing unedited content, you guys would be at the edge of your seats because I'll tell you right now, it's absolute chaos. It's so unhinged. <laughs> I would. I really can't. Sh- I can't uh, yeah. advocate for showing you these videos. I could. These... I could advocate because I think it would really show who we are. This, I guess this that's is true. this is very edited. This is very edited. <laughs> we started at what six thirty? It's eight thirty. That's two hours of content. There's blood, tears, sweat. A lot of pain. Pain. So much pain. A lot of happy. Yeah, a decent amount. A lot of laughs, but we just... It's like a ping pong. Boom, 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 yeah. Boom, boom. D trying me for the whole episode. Right, D? Someone's PMSing. <laughs> no comment. That's true. That's true. And it's crazy because our cycles are almost, like, synced. She just knew she's at RUPMS <laughs> when she walked in here. I said, You already know the answer to that. <laughs> anyway, we're gonna call it so I can edit this and go to bed reasonably early. Alright, good night, all. Good night, sweet dreams. See you next week. See you next week. Peace out. Peace out. What do we say? Stay killing it. You're Keep killing, killing it. it. You're killing it. Keep you, killing you, it. You, um,. You, uh, you nutter. Nutto. Nutto. Keep killing it out there. Nuttos. Nuttos. Not people, just, uh, accomplishments. (laughs) (laughs) All right, bye. Bye.